prepared to give a reason for the hope that dwells inside of us. And so, Lord, once again, we open up Your Bible for that purpose, that we would be instructed and we would be prepared for every good work that You have. So again, Lord, as we're looking at this wonderful end times, these future events, Lord, that You have for us, we just rejoice in Your Word that gives us so, such hope for today that, Lord, as we open it, that You would bless us and that we would see, Father, these great things that You have done for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn and greet your neighbors. neighbors. Greetings. Yes. Is it in the monitor? We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 32. We'll be starting at verse 1 today. Rebecca, are the monitors on up here or something? It just kind of seems that way. There, that's much better. Isaiah chapter 32. But first, we're going to do some biblical gymnastics and way of preparation. Go ahead and turn. You can keep your thumb over in Isaiah, but turn to Romans. Romans chapter 11. God's got such wonderful future for us. And we read about these things, and they're just amazing things, and they can almost be beyond us. And the Apostle Paul, well, you can see there were times when, when they were even so much, so much more miraculous than he could even comprehend. Now, in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul, he's writing some of the richest theology that we have, salvation and justification and just, just these rich things. And then it's almost like he comes to an awareness of the things that he has just written and in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become His counselor? Or who has first given to Him, and it shall be repaid to Him? For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Just glorifying God for these Amazing things that he's done. Turn over to the left to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He's looking at just how we can be so concerned. And he's looking at those who are preoccupied with their past. In verse 1, he comes to the conclusion, there is, there, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So if you're in Christ, it doesn't matter what your past is, you're your life is hidden with Christ. As far as the trials and tribulations of today, verse 28 tells us that we know, you can know this, all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. And if you're fearful of your future, we're told that neither height nor depth, this is in verse 39, or any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So some practical things that we're able to grasp on to even this day. But in verse 18, he's looking at the reality of the suffering in the believer's life, and he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so he's so looking forward to the future and these promises and the realization of these promises. Are you? Are you looking forward to those things? Now, we'll believe those things, but do you believe those things while meditating upon these things? And what I mean by meditating upon these things, given deep thought to these things. Deep thought to, well, the rapture. The rapture could happen at any time, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Have you ever just meditated upon the rapture? God just taking us and all of a sudden being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? Just an amazing thing. These end time events being set in motion, well, they're already in motion, but pick up in frequency and, and looking at these things and the reality of these things as the Bible says that these things are going to happen and these things are happening, we see that the focus of the world is all in that one area where we see that well, we've studied the book of Ezekiel, we're looking at the book of Isaiah, where they say all these things are going to happen. And again, today it so seems as if the stage is set. And again, meditating upon these things, believing these things, and receiving these things. Turn over to the book of Revelation. We'll, we'll get to Isaiah in a minute. The book of Revelation, chapter 20. The kids were learning this on Thursday night and Sunday morning. 
It's the millennial age. The millennial age, well, because God is a just God, there's that thousand-year period, that thousand-year period that we will reign with Christ as kings and priests. Now, why is he just? Well, at the beginning of chapter 20, we're, we're, we see here, it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. He lay hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So, if you'll notice, chapter 20, it's just before chapter 21. And chapter 21 is a new heaven and a new earth. Before God destroys the current one, He's not going to so much give it another chance because he knows what's going to happen, but this is going to validate the judgments that are to come. And so, Flip Wilson, that great theologian in the 60s, if you were around then, what was one of his uh, phrases that he coined? The devil made me do it. And how many times have you heard that excuse? The devil made me do it. So what did Jesus just do here in chapter 20? He took the devil out of the equation. He took the devil out of the equation and now we are going to be reigning as priests and kings during this thousand year period. The rapture has happened, the time of tribulation has happened, the second coming of Christ has happened, and now we're reigning during that time of the thousand years. Now why would we need to reign as kings and priests? Because there's people still being born. There's people still being born, and still marrying and going through their lives and so on and so forth. And those are the people that we're ruling and reigning over. It's not a reign or rule of terror, but this is absolute righteousness. Righteous reign of Christ through his people. And so no longer will man walk by faith. He'll walk by sight at this period of time. But there's still going to be issues that need to be dealt with because those people that continue to be born, they still have a sinful nature within themselves. Then the, sa the, the Satan, the devil, is going to be released from his prison. And it says in verse 7, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So the devil is going to deceive people once again, as many as the sand of the sea. And it's just an amazing thing that he's going to try once again to conquer Christ and his kingdom. Verse 9 they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. The camp of the saints would be Jerusalem and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So boom, it's gone. And then in verse 10 we see the judgment of the devil. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verses 11 through 15 is the great white throne judgment where all man apart from Christ stands before God to be judged. And then entering into chapter 21, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. And so it's gone and there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. Jerusalem is going to descend down from heaven and man will live in the presence of God from that time on. Go ahead and turn back over to Isaiah. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the millennial age. And Isaiah gives us some rich pictures of the millennial age. Now, for the past couple of weeks, we looked at two main topics. They were kind of semi-topical studies as we were going through the book of Isaiah. Two weeks ago, we looked at fear and the reality of fear in a believer's life and what a believer is to do about fear. And then last week, we looked at worry in a Christian life. Should a Christian really be filled with worry? Now, both studies boiled down to you either having a biblical basis for your life or basing your worldview upon worldly wisdom. If you base your world upon worldly wisdom, then you're going to be filled with fear and worry. If it's a biblical view, well then, you should be trusting in the Lord. A worldview will be filled with human speculation. What's going to happen next week? And the speculators, they're out there, and they're pronouncing doom. Or, just as bad, they're pronouncing how much better everything is going to get. Now, this is apart from God. This is human speculation. Because what are they looking for? They're looking for heaven here on earth. And there's going to come a time, they say, when there will be world peace. The Bible doesn't say that. There will be time when diseases are all done away. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. There will be time when we're going to all live in harmony, and the Bible just does not say that. So, 
that you have human speculation that is promising all these things, but we look at the reality of what's going on across the world, and we worry. Because, well, what if ISIS, what if they keep growing? What if they keep expanding Islam? What if they come into this country? And we're, we can be so caught up in these things. Now, we need to be concerned, but as far as worry, we just read to the end. We win. We're, we're on the winning side. And God is going to emerge victorious over all of this. And so, worldly view will be filled with human speculation. A biblical view will be filled with divine revelation. And it's divine or godly revelation that we stake our future upon. Common sense reveals to us the holes that exist in human speculation. In James chapter 4, verse 14, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So man does not know what's going to happen tomorrow. Human speculation is basically man guessing at what's going to happen. Divine revelation has nothing to do with even common sense. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end is the way of death. There's a way that seems right. There's a way that makes a lot of sense. That's based on common sense, but even that, apart from God, leads to, leads to separation from God or leads to death. So divine revelation has nothing to do even with common sense, but biblical realities. Biblical realities ingrained in our souls by the will of the Holy Spirit. So that when we look at these end-time events, we're able to grasp onto them. And as Job said, oh, how my heart yearns within me. He so looked forward to those days that, well, they were going to be real in his life and the pain that he's experienced, the wrong that's done to us and all of these things. Well, we just continue to keep our eyes upon Jesus. Continue to keep our eyes upon Jesus because we know as he's told his apostles and told us through them, he's gone to prepare a place for us and where he is, we will be that one day also. And so it's here where true, enduring trust is built in a person's life that reduces fear and worry to an afterthought. Isaiah 57, verse 15, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. I say that a lot, and this is where I get it from. God inhabits eternity. He doesn't just inhabit your tomorrow, although He does. He doesn't just inhabit next week already, although He does. He inhabits eternity. He's beyond time. And so that tells me that God is the God over time. He's the God over our future. And so we don't have to fear and we truly can trust in him. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Why? Why does God inhabit eternity? To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And so those who have humbled themselves and put their dependency upon God, God inhabits eternity for our benefit. And so again, as I've said so many times, whatever it is that you're entering into tomorrow, whatever it is that you're entering into next week, you are entering into what God has already prepared. You are not entering into a situation or circumstance aspiring out of control. And you may say, well, Pastor Mike, I'm concerned with what I'm entering into. Well, th there can be hard things. It's a hard things that we, that we well, have to deal with in our life. And, and sometimes we can make such big giants out of those things, and we can be so concerned. We'll be like King Saul where we're, we're, we're pulled up and we're inactive on one side of a valley, and that giant keeps coming up and cursing until until we can have the heart of David, the heart of David that understands the magnitude of his God and is willing to face the giants. Because I know God inhabits my future, I'm entering into what God has for me, so because of that, I can boldly face the unknown, I can boldly face the issues that I have built up to be giants even in my own mind. So the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at a series of woes or warnings of impending judgments proclaimed against Judah, and the backdrop is the Assyrian invasion. Now, when 911 happened, it just seemed to me, I remember feeling this on that morning, like things are just all of a sudden spiraling out of control. World Trade Center just fell. The Pentagon was attacked, and now they're talking about an airplane that is coming for the White House. 
and you're thinking, how are we going to stop this? Or where does this all end? Well, think of Judah. Here's Assyria, and they've conquered countries, and now they're moving in, or they have already moved into Judah, and they're headed to Jerusalem. And so God, in the midst of this, is offering, not offering, but presenting some warnings to them. And we've been looking at this series. We'll finish it up next week. But in chapter 28, it was woe to wanton rulers. In, I'm sorry, in chapter 29, it was woe to worthless worship. Chapter 29, the last part, woe to wily schemers. Chapter 30, woe to willful children. Chapter 31, woe to worldly worry. And then next week in chapter 33, woe to wicked oppressors. But tonight we have a bit of an interlude. And he's been doing that at the end of each of the chapters, but tonight he gives us a full chapter here. This interlude is the prophet Isaiah reminds us of better things to come. That regardless of what's going on in the world, look at what the psalmist had to say in Psalm chapter 2, at the very first part. It's almost as if David had insight and is looking around and he says, why do the nations rage? Or why do they conspire? And we live in the midst of raging nations and conspiracies. And when I mean conspiracies, coming up against God and God's will, God's revealed will. And so a conspiracy in this particular context could be what has recently happened to marriage or what is happening to genders and how they kind of being erased or whatever it might be. There's all this conspiring, there's all this raging against God. It says, and the people plot a vain thing, a very conceited thing. The kings on the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away the cords from us. And so that's what the world is doing. They're busy casting God out of the equation or at least they're trying to cast God out of the equation. But God will not be cast out of the equation. And so Isaiah, in that dark day back in his day, and even in the darkness of our day today, there's better things to come. God's got a plan. Again, we've already read, even tonight, we looked at it a little bit, what's going to happen at the end. But every so often, in the midst of worldly rulers and all of these woes, God's got in his word these reminders of the future. And today it's going to be the millennial age. It's going to be a better times to come. Again, that thousand year period that we will rule and reign with Christ as kings and priests. All of those who are of that at that time will be those who have died and gone to be with the Lord and have been reunited with their spiritual bodies or those who have been raptured, who've been transformed and brought to be with the Lord. There will be some who had gone through the, uh, uh, the um, tribulation time there will be some that even in the middle of the millennial age will die a natural death and will be translated right away and then will be ruling and reigning with Christ again. But it will be God's people pulled together underneath the rule of God. So in the midst of the raging of the nations of this world, we're reminded of a few things. And you need to be reminded of a few things because there's a lot of raging going on. Again, we're approaching elections. And I'll be using this one for the next year and a half or so. Well, actually, now it's, what, it's a year away. Wow, it's coming. But we've seen the debates. And right now, it's Republican raging against Republican. And it's Democrat raging against Democrat. And then after they get all of that settled and they each present a, 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 a candidate, then they're going to start loving that candidate who they're talking very evil of. And, but then there's going to be the raging between the parties. And there's going to be all this that goes on and accumulates until somebody is elected. And then this new person that's elected is going to be, well, all hell the coming king. And they're going to look at him as being our provider and he's going to change everything from the previous administration. And it doesn't matter if it's Democrat or Republican, but sooner or later he's going to fail because that person's not God. And then the raging is going to start against that administration again and it just keeps going in this horrible cycle. We've got the raging of wars across the nation. Seems like we had a relative time of peace, Vietnam, but if you look at the history books, there's been wars just about every year throughout the ages. The laws that we see that are being brought against Christianity and contrary to the Word of God, and just seems like every aspect of human life, there's just that raging that goes on. But 
there's going to come a time, and this is what we have in verses 1 through 4, of a coming king. A coming king as no king ever before. It says, verse 1, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. That will be you who is ruling and reigning with the Lord. Verse 2, A man will be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in weary land. The eyes of those who see will not be dim, and the ears of those who hear will listen. Also the heart of the rash will understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammers will be ready to speak plainly. We have been immersed as of late, again, in these debates. And in them, you do have some good insight, but the problem is it can be so buried in the rhetoric and the agendas of the left and the rhetoric and the agendas on the right. But we must ask ourselves in these potential leaders. Now, I'm using this in contrast to the king that we'll see here, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. I'm sure you can understand that more than likely it's the Lord. But this is in contrast. The leaders that we're going to be electing and the leaders that we're going to be thinking that are going to make this a better place. Well, not necessarily us, but the world will be thinking that. So, working backwards in 3 and 4, it says, in the tongue of the stammers will be ready to speak plainly. But I look at our leaders today, and do they speak plainly? When it says plainly, it means clearly. Or are they double-tongued? Are they just kind of telling us what we want to hear? And and don't you get that impression? They're, They're making all of these great promises. See, now we're electing a president. We're not electing a sovereign king. And so these these candidates will make all of these great promises that they have absolutely no power to deliver on. And actually, what I really believe, and it's proven to be true, they're just telling us what we want to hear to get elected with no intention really of following through or no ability to do so. They really have to ask, do they really speak from the foundation of wisdom and knowledge? Donald Trump, does he speak from the foundation of wisdom and and knowledge. Our current president, does he speak from the foundation of wisdom and knowledge? You take any of them across the board. Do they really speak from the foundation of wisdom and knowledge? And be careful, the president who calls himself a Christian. Now, we've got so many checklists in the Bible. Do they adhere? Because the majority of the presidents that call themselves Christians don't line up with a biblical definition of a Christian or what a Christian is. I'm not saying all of them, but nonetheless, they need to be careful about that one. Because they know if they can present themselves as being a Christian, that's a lot of votes. That's a lot of votes. And so, do they speak from the foundation of wisdom and knowledge? To make this determination, both wisdom and knowledge need to be taken down to their foundational sources. So what's the foundational source of wisdom and knowledge? Well, we're told very clearly in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Do we elect people in office who truly have a fear of the Lord? I'd present by the results that they've been producing, the answer would clearly be no. Fear of the Lord, a respect of God and and who God is. A fear, a genuine fear of saying or, or doing the wrong thing. Part of the reason that I study and make sure that I get the word right is a fear of the Lord. There's a great responsibility, as God has brought in no matter how many people, there's a great responsibility to rightly divide the Word of God. And if some of the false teachers that you see, if they really had a fear of the Lord, they wouldn't be standing up there saying the things that, they, that they're saying. Matter of fact, the problem, the problem that exists is one that Paul pointed out in Romans chapter 3, verse 18. It's as if Paul looked around, and we can do that today, and he said, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And we look around at our society today, there is no fear of God before their eyes. I look at our governor here in California, there's no fear of God before his eyes. I can't judge the man's soul, but I can judge the man's actions. And I look at the, the, the state representatives, there's no fear of God before their eyes. I look across this nation and generally speaking, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Next, do our political leaders, do they listen? And the ears, this last part of verse 3, and the ears of those who hear will listen. There's going to come that time, but are they listening today? 
If so, for what purpose do they really listen? Is it to help? Is it to care for? Is it to provide for those whom they represent? Or is their listening for the purpose simply once again of getting elected? Making a determination is, what do I need to say to be able to get this person to vote for us? Lastly, do they see, the first part of verse 3, the eyes of those who see will not be dim. Are their eyes dim today? better question would be, what do they see? Is their vision of a reality clouded? Do they have a disconnect from society? Do they understand how things really are? Do they understand how it, how it is to be, to, to work, to make a living, and to barely scrape by? I look at the taxes that are being implemented upon California businesses, and so many businesses are being driven out of the state, and I'm thinking, do they really understand? I remember when I had my business, and it was always some new fee, some new tax that was placed upon the businesses. Whenever they were going to fund something, it was always, okay, well, this is going to be added to this tax, or this will be added to this business, or whatever it might be. And I was just thinking, man, I only had a few employees, and they were killing me. I can imagine some of the larger companies. And again, what my, my thought was, do they really have a clear understanding here? A clear understanding of what makes the economy work and what brings jobs in. And you look at these things and you're thinking, do they see and how could they possibly see? Throughout the history, there is always an element of corruption present in the leaders in office. Why? Because they're just men, men and women. They're just human beings. And then there's going to come a point in history. After all of this frustration, and really it's all going to accumulate in the Antichrist, but then, chapter 32, verse 1, behold. Now, it's interesting. Probably before we finish Isaiah, I should do a word study on behold because I, Isaiah uses this word throughout. Behold, or check this out. It's as if these prophecies are given to him and he's even amazed by me. Check this out. Or behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. There's going to come a time that there's going to be this king, a king, a king will come and rule in righteousness. What does it mean to rule in righteousness? Well, what is righteous? We talk about righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is an action that is based upon godly standards. It's an adherence to God's word. And so I present a life that is righteous before God as I live it properly based upon the word of God. Not perfectly, but properly. Properly, first of all, depending upon the grace of God for when I fail, but secondly, desiring to do God's word, not for salvation, but because of salvation. And that being the case, I want to push forward and live this righteous life that I am to be able to present to God, and it's going to be anything but perfect, but there's going to come a king who will rule in absolute righteousness. Think of righteousness as rightness. Rightness in the sight of God. Just think, if we had a leader who led in such a way in righteousness that everything he did was absolutely right, just think of what a society we would live in. Absolutely right in the sight of, of God. Think of the sight. Not only would, would, would the judgments work properly, but then again we would be presenting a society to God that God would bless and that God would multiply and a society that would prosper, and a society that would do well. Right? Right is that which is proper for a situation, again, based upon God's standards. So, you look at the laws of California as of late. Are they righteous? Are they even close to being righteous? Look at the laws of the land. Are they righteous? Do they seek after God's standards? Well, in actuality, they're contrary to God's standards. I mean, look again, you just see it in the gender-based issues. These are completely contrary to the Word of God and detrimental to the people. And so this is what we're presenting California. Do you think God is going to bless that? And we, as those who make the decisions, these people, us people who cast our ballots, we truly need to consider the Lord and the desires of the Lord. See, a fear of the Lord, it needs to start in our heart. And it needs to go forth into the voting booth and it needs to extend through to the elected officials in that capacity. Now, mind you, it seems to me that a lot of the times we're voting for the lesser of evils, 
But again, it's got to start with a heart of prayer and desire to see God's will come to pass. So who is this king? Well, there's a progression in these two chapters, chapter 32 and chapter 33. Verse 1, he's presented as a king. And then in chapter 33, verse 17, he's presented as the king. And then in chapter 33, verse 22, the Lord is king. And so the king that is referred to here is definitely the Lord. And whether or not you crown this king as your king, the king of your life, the fact of the matter is he is king over all. And that's one of the things that we truly need to consider when it seems like things are falling apart, when it seems like it's time to fall into fear or go the direction of worry, God is still king. He's still seated upon the throne. And Jesus Christ is the king. And when I say king of kings, the capital K king over all lowercase kings, the capital case L lord over all lowercase lords. Throughout all of history, everybody who has been in power, Jesus Christ is over all. Turn in your Bibles to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Paul spells it out very clearly. Very common or well-known verses, but nonetheless, do as well to revisit them. First of all, beware of false prophets. Chapter 2, not chapter 3. I wrote the wrong, the wrong address down. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Joanne, you got that wrong. You're bad. <laughs> no, that was me. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Man constantly tries to exalt himself. We saw Adolf Hitler, we saw Saddam Hussein, and leader after leader trying to highly exalt themselves. But it says here, God has highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus Christ, if you would read this whole in context, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus it says every knee. Now when it says every knee, that's every knee that has ever been created. And really, it's every heart that has ever been created. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And when it says should bow, that means will bow. Of those in heaven, and those on earth, and those under the earth. That's all of creation. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So because God has established Jesus Christ as our Lord, He did that upon the cross and raising Him from the dead, He has established Him as our Lord and King. He's established Him above all others because there was not a one who could go to that cross, pay the price for your sins, die, and be raised from the dead. He couldn't do that, but since Christ did it, God has established Him as that King. And there will come a time when all human arrogance will end and be dealt with by God. The human arrogant are those who highly exalt themselves. The commonality with everybody who has highly exalted themselves, at some point they have fallen very low. For some, that day will come when they recognize Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they will bow their knee. I was busy building my kingdom. I was busy trying to do the best that I could to build Mike's kingdom. But then there came that day into my life that Jesus Christ was displayed as Lord and it was undeniable. I bowed my knee. I bowed my knee. I, I humbled myself and received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so there will be some who recognize Jesus Christ as their Lord and they will bow their knee and confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and they'll be saved. For others, that day, the day of bowing their knee, will come when they can no longer confess Jesus as Lord by faith, but will come when they confess Him by sight. And we didn't get into it, but we looked at it in Revelation chapter 20. As He seated upon that place of judgment, their knee will be bowed at that time. They will confess with their mouths, but then they will be judged. This is the day that the Apostle Paul spoke of in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. And so all humanity will make that decision. Are you under the law or are you under grace? 
If you're under the law, you will be judged by the law. If you are under grace, then you will be given grace. It says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. Again, nobody will be able to offer any excuses and all the world may become guilty before God. And so going back to Isaiah chapter 32, there's going to come that time. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. This is during the millennial age. Jesus Christ will be that king. You're the princes. We are the princes who will rule along with him. Verse 2, a man will be a hiding place from the wind and a covering from the tempest or the storm as rivers of water in a dry place as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. In verse 1, we have the adverb righteousness that speaks of the deity of the king because the only one who can rule in righteousness is the Lord Jesus Christ. But in verse 2 here, a man, we see a picture of his humanity. This man will be our protector against all that comes up against his people. It's what the candidate offers, or at least tries to offer, is protection, but there's certain things that he can do absolutely nothing about. Jesus, the Lord, will be able to deliver. He will be our protector against all that comes up against his people. The best commentary, I think, on verse 2, let me read it through. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind, a cover from the tempest, and rivers of water in a dry place as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. New Testament commentary on that would be Matthew 7, 24 through 25. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built this house on the rock, and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded upon the rock. Now here it's in faith in the word of God. Here it's going to be reality as we give homage to the king. It seems that natural disasters are the ones that we are the most helpless against in that they are strong, sudden, and severe. But if you're founded upon the rock, you will endure. Matthew 8, 27 so the men marveled, this is at the settling of the sea, the men marveled saying, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Whatever it might be that can affect our lives, Jesus Christ is Lord over. Jesus Christ is protector and Jesus Christ is the provider. Again, verses three and four, now we have these things that have been done in perfection in the Lord. Verse three, the eyes of those who see will not be dim. And the ears of those who hear will listen. Also the heart of the rash will understand knowledge. And the tongue of the stammerers will be ready to speak plainly. So the eyes of those who see will not be dim. Things at that point will be seen exactly as they are. No gray areas. No people hiding things. Things will be open. Those people who are ruling and reigning will rule and reign in absolute truth. And the ears of those who hear will listen, will be able to hear the reality of a matter. Also the heart of the rash will understand knowledge. Why? Because there will be a fear of the Lord. And the tongue of the stammers will be ready to speak plainly. You'll be able to receive of the truth that is being spoken. It's now that truth will reign in a society when God is truly king. John, the apostle John said in 3 John verse 4, there's only one chapter, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. And there will come that day that we will walk or live our lives in absolute truth. Verses 5 through 8, we have the floundering fool. The foolish person will no longer be called generous, nor the miser said to be bountiful. And so the idea here is that there's this respect for for those people who aren't of the Lord, and we can so do that with our movie stars, politicians, athletes, or, or whatever, and the idea is that there's kind of this awe factor. The foolish person will no longer be called generous, nor the miser said to be bountiful, for the foolish person will speak foolishness, and his heart will work iniquity, to practice ungodliness, to utter error against the Lord, to keep the hungry unsatisfied, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. Also, the schemers of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaks justice. But a generous man devises generous things. 
and by generosity he shall stand. In a lot of places there where it says generous, you can substitute the word noble. It's in the sight of the Lord. So who is the fool? Well, that's something that would do, we would do well just to kind of look at it just briefly because pretty much every time that a fool is brought to light in the Scripture, a lot of times that fool is the person who has the ability to know God and know of God, but refuses the Lord. See, with the higher awareness of God comes the realization of the fool. And we just had that higher uh, realization. Now, again, we do not confuse foolishness with a lack of intelligence and do not confuse knowledge with wisdom. A fool can have knowledge. A fool can have wisdom, but he just chooses to remain ignorant. And so we have knowledge of all of God's creation. And the Bible says man is without excuse. I mean, you have to look at evolution and you have to look how you have to willfully check a lot of your brain at the door in order to truly push God out of the equation and bring evolution into the equation. And so you look at this, and if you look honestly at it, you have to think, well, this is just foolishness to, to believe in this because you have to have greater faith to believe in evolution than you do to believe in God. And God is going to say in that time of judgment, no, you were without excuse because of even my creation It spoke very clearly of me. And it's one thing to sin ignorantly, but God is going to judge us on our ability to understand. It's quite another thing to sin with the knowledge of God. And that's what man is doing today. Psalm 14, verse 1, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. Now, if you look at Psalm 14.1, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in Psalm 53.1, they basically say the same thing. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, if you look at your Bible, in your Bible, the words there is, as in there is no God, there is are in italics. And again, that means that the translators have added that for the purpose of clarification. But I think the plain reading is the best reading. The fool has said in his heart, no, God, no, God. He has chosen to remain ignorant of the existence of God. God has revealed himself to the, to the fool, even though the fool may have high intelligence, but he has determined to ignore the existence and the reality of of God. And so we see that today by in so many different areas. You see it behind pulpits. You see it in, in, uh, in the educational field. You see it in the political arena. You see just anybody who will push God out of the equation. I even look at our vice president. Our vice president claims to be such a great Catholic. Or, or you look at Teddy Kennedy who claimed to be such a great Catholic. And you see the laws that they passed, and there's something there that doesn't line up with the abortion thing, and the gay marriage thing, and all of these things that are contrary to God. And you're thinking, man, what a fool. They, they've said in their heart, no, God, because they didn't say in their heart there is no God. They admitted that there's a God, but they're just being disobedient to the God that they know exists. And that's worse. And as that's worse, you can see the amount or the degree of judgment, or at least how every mouth is going to stop, or they're not going to be able to offer excuse. And again, you have the description here of the fool who says no, no to God. They're corrupt. They have done abominable works or works that are contrary to God's will. There is none. None of those people are able to really do good. And again, you've spoken of Teddy Kennedy, the good that he's done. Well, in the sight of God, he didn't do any good because he was rotten to the core, if you will, just as we were all rotten to the core apart from a relationship with the Lord. And so I've got to understand in the political arena, just because that's in the forefront today, I need to understand how deep these biblical concepts go into the core of who these people are. Because I know it goes deep into the core of who I am. And as you see these things, you've got to understand the reality of representing God in this world, even if you're standing against the tide, even if you're going against the grain. Because as you stand strong in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's then, especially as there's this opposition, as the opposition increases, God being glorified increases. But God's people, they have to stand. And Ezekiel, they were looking for a man to stand in the gap, to be a wall. And he said, at that point, they found none. And that's when Jerusalem was, was, uh, was destroyed. 
Thirdly, we have worrying women. Verse 9, rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In a year, in some days, you will be troubled, you complacent women, for the vintage will fail. The gathering will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Strip yourselves and make yourselves bare and, and gird sackcloth on your waist. People shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come up thorns and briars, yes, on the happy homes and the joyous cities, because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling cities will be deserted, the forts and the towers will become liars forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. We saw last week that the born-again believer is not to be a worry wart, but a believer living in disobedience or an unbeliever, they've got plenty to worry about. These women, they have plenty to worry about. And the idea is these women are the ones who have assumed their positions because they're married to these ungodly men. They understood the ungodliness of it all, but nonetheless, because they had a cushy life, they were willing to support their husbands in their ungodliness. These women would be the aristocrats of society, the beneficiary of those fools that we just talked about. Remember the one who most famously said, let them eat cake, Marie Antoinette, Antoinette during the French Revolution? The peasants were starting to rise up. They had enough of the aristocrats of the day. And when this queen was told of this, her response, let him eat cake. Now, cake wasn't cake as we think of cake. Cake was a meal of a very poor person. Let him remain poor. Let him be kept in their place. Marie ended up losing her head for that comment. And again, the idea here is not only the fools are going to be judged, but the wives who have attached themselves to these fools and have benefited from, being, uh, from these fools, they will be judged as well. Amos chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. This is a very insulting uh, term. It's directed to the ladies. Uh, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppose the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by His holiness, behold, the day shall come upon you when He will take you away with fish hooks and your prosperity with fish hooks. Not only will these people one day lose their luxuries, but they're also going to lose their necessities as well. A little picture of society, just real quick, verse 12. People shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. So the vines are going to be taken away. Wine, wine in the scriptures, a lot of the times is a picture of joy. There will be no joy in the land. Verse 13. On the land of my people will come up thorns and briars. That's a picture of sin. What was it upon the Lord's head? What was it that was proclaimed at the curse in Genesis chapter 3? Thorns and briars. It's the reality of sin in the land. And then verse 14, Because the palaces will be forsaken, the bristling city will be deserted, the forts, uh, forts and towers will become liars forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pastor of flocks. Forts and towers, that's something that promises security, but it's a security that they can't offer. I look at that, and I would imagine the Jew of the day would think, how could that happen here? Isn't that how we think? Isn't that what we think when we hear you know, of, of evil as it rises up in the Middle East and whatever? How could that happen here? Let God take his hand off this nation, and it will happen here. And you go through and, and reread this, because the palaces will be forsaken and the bustling city will be deserted. And you think, how could that possibly happen here? It very well could. The forts and the towers, that which we depend upon strength, will become liars forever. They're not going to be able to produce what we've been depending upon them to produce. And it says it will become a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. It will become that which is simply barren land. Why? Because we have rejected the Lord. Verses 12 through 20, though, speak of better things to come. I say 12, 16 through 20. Then justice, now he's speaking back in the millennial age, then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace. 
and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings and in quiet resting places. Though hell comes down on the forest and the city is brought low in humiliation, blessed are those who sow beside all waters and who send out freely the feet of the ox and the donkey. As for us today, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no need to worry. There's no need to fear. You need to have a fear of the Lord, but we have been justified by God. Justified by God, and now we have peace with God. And then now we even see this great promise that we have, that everything as it rages today, one day we are going to be brought to the place of perfect peace. No longer having to deal with the issues that we deal today, but ruling and reigning with God. And then there's going to come that time of a new heaven and new earth, and from then on, we'll dwell with him forever. And there's not going to be a sun, not going to be any stars, but the glory of God is going to illuminate our lives. Father, we just thank you for this word and for that time. And I just pray, Father, that we would be a people who would meditate upon these things. That, Lord, we would grasp on to the reality of these things and understand that these words and these promises are to your people. And, Father, those who are born-again believers here tonight, we're your people. And so, Father, I just pray again, Lord, that we would receive the bridge promises and they would offer us a comfort in the midst of the raging that goes on in the world today. And so, once again, Father, as we come before you, we lift up this coming week. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who inhabits eternity, that again, Father, we enter into that which you have already prepared for us. Father, I pray that we would have a confidence and that we would have a boldness in that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you all stand, please? We had a really good...